All right. Hello, everyone, and welcome to A History of Hollywood Strikes. Um, as I was saying on the upfront with Mark and Todd, this has been a program that more than any other um, film program I put together that I have had to consistently edit, including up until today, to make changes as to what was happening. And um, as I said earlier, I thought at the very least the SAG after strike would be over. I figured they would have worked something out. I'm very surprised they are still on strike. Writers traditionally hold out a lot longer. Um, and as we'll go through this for reasons that are fairly valid, uh, because the shape of media in is ever changing. Uh, but I've always found I'm I mean, I'm doing this for two reasons. One, it's very topical and it deals with film and film history, which I find fascinating. And I also have been getting a lot into labor history uh, lately, a book that I read, The Disney Revolt, uh, specifically for this program. There's a book I'm going to reread called A History of America and Ten Strikes. Um, we're also just seeing across a lot of industries right now, a very renewed interest in labor organizing as we see in stuff like Amazon and Starbucks and the attempts to unionize. And we're also seeing a lot more uh, head to head battles with the unions versus the companies. We saw this in the summer with uh, the UPS and the Teamsters, uh, a strike that was averted. And now we have the UAW and the big three auto industry. So labor, I think, is on a lot of people's minds. But Hollywood has always been one that's interesting, interested to me because um, it is one of the most unionized industries in the entire country. Um, and considering how exploitative Hollywood can be, and frankly is, you would not expect that, but that's partially why I think they are so unionized because um, it's well documented how exploitative studios were, directors were, uh, back in the early days of Hollywood. So I'll start sharing. I'm just gonna ask that everyone who is not, um... yep, I know. Uh, so just everyone who is not Mark or Todd, uh, just make sure that your uh, mics are muted. Come on, slideshow. So, brief history of Hollywood strikes. And as you're going to see in this slideshow, I've noted a few things that are as of today's date, September 18th, 2023, because again, stuff is changing. So, before we get started, you're going to see a lot of letters, a lot of abbreviations. So, we're going to go over what they all mean. So SAG after uh, SAG is Screen Actors Guild after the American Federation of Television and Radio Artists. SAG after Mer they used to be two separate unions. SAG after merged in 2012. If you hear us go, um, the AMPTP that's the American um, Motion Picture and Television Producers. They used to be called the um, Alliance of Film Producers. DGA, Directors Guild of America, WGA as Writers Guild of America, or if you see in the news, WJE, WJAE, WJW, that's East and West. Um, you might see a little bit of uh, YATSE, which is uh, International Alliance of Theatrical and Stage Employees, and they almost had a strike too, but I don't think YATSE has ever uh, actually had a formal strike, at least not recently, probably because everyone realizes if YATSE goes on strike, that's truly it. Everything is shutting down. Whereas you could still do certain things with a WGA and a SAC strike. But uh, if you want to just take a photo of this or kind of commit this to memory, this is what the stuff means um we're going to be using a lot of shorthand but i usually try to put in the slides um for some of the stuff like the afm and amptp what they stand for there we go so why is the current strike happening um to distill it down to the big causes it's ai and residuals and if we go when we go through this program, residuals are a consistent reason for striking. And again, this is one where when you look at it from the context of people who work in this industry, it makes sense. The media landscape shifts, the way for uh, companies and studios to profit off of media shifts, 
and people who work on it would also like a share of that as well. So we have streaming, which we did not have at the last WGA strike, which is 2007 to 2008. And the compensation of which has been, let's just say, less than great. Um, there's a quote from Ben Mankiewicz uh, from Turner Classic Movies, uh, where he says, uh, he's talking about the 1960 strike. Oh, Todd, could you let someone in? where he says, quote, that's when the parallels come in here. How do we account for streaming? There are no residuals in streaming. You know, it's a wonderful opportunity. Um, I have occasional to talk to Mel Brooks and he always complains, yeah, Netflix. Sure, they're paying Adam Sandler 200 million up front, but there's nothing on the back end. And of course, Adam Sandler getting 200 million up front may not be the best example to show how unjust and how bad the residuals are for streaming because for a lot of us, $200 million is a ton of money. For most people, pretty much everybody, it's a lot of money, even if you have as much money as Adam Sandler. But think about it if you're a smaller actor. Um, uh, as an example, it came out recently, Kimiko Glenn, who was in um, at least, I think seasons four through seven, of Orange is the New Black, a show that pretty much made Netflix. She got her paycheck for being in the show up front, but she talked about what her current residuals from that show are. A show that has been streamed, well, we don't know how often it's been streamed because Netflix doesn't give us that, that um, information, but she's only made $27 since her initial paycheck. And when you think about how often Orange is the New Black has been streamed, you look at that and you're like that probably doesn't add up oh sorry went earlier um that doesn't add up so that's a big reason why and the same goes for writers as well um a lot of writers back in the day like if you talk to people who used to be simpsons writers they used to make enough money to live on for the rest of their lives because of these contract negotiations where they could make money on its initial run and then in reruns and then in syndication and that doesn't really exist for writers anymore in in the streaming world and the same goes for actors the other big concern is artificial intelligence and i know um eric uh, mark eric told me you had some thoughts about this but for the actors concern there's control over their image and another big problem or concern is how it relates to extras um right as the sag sag after strike started it came out that producers wanted to take a scan of an extra's body and then use that in perpetuity without paying any of the extras any residuals which again that's your likeness you know if you get a two thousand dollar paycheck one time yet your image is used over and over in the background you're really you know wouldn't you think you deserve to be paid a little bit more and from the writer standpoint they're more worried that studios are going to have ai just generate scripts and rather than having a proper writer's room which again if you love shows like Frasier, you love shows like uh, The Simpsons, the writer's room in the golden years were why those were so beloved because they had people working on it the entire season. Now, a lot of writers are worried and they're already kind of, some studios are doing this. They're just bringing people in for the day to punch up scripts and they're not paying them to work on the scripts as the season goes on. Um. There are some other issues in terms of meal breaks, motion capture work. How do we get compensated for that? What are the proper breaks for that? And as I've said earlier, the writer's room is a big issue. And it's more that the writer's room doesn't really exist anymore. And also, I was listening to um, Adam Conover, who is probably most well known for his, his series, Adam Ruins Everything, but he's on the negotiating committee for the WGA. And he's talked about how, if you watch Netflix, how they'll go like, oh, we're doing season one season one part one it's only 10 episodes and then season two uh, season one part two they don't tell the writers that they're splitting it up like that they tell the writers oh we're doing two seasons and then they just uh, you know are two seasons of 10 episodes and then they just go oh no you only really wrote one season so we're only paying you for one season so there are some streaming companies doing fairly underhanded stuff already. So that is why there is the strike. Um, and again, as someone who's listened to a lot of people who are uh, both SAG actors and WJ, I'm like, I think a lot of these are valid 
you know, valid concerns. So that's where I am on that issue. So let's, I would like to do a little bit of myth versus reality because I see this especially when the actors strike and they talk about residuals and salary. Everyone goes like, well, don't they have enough money? But most actors don't make a ton of money. Or as I, I used to call it, they don't make Brad Pitt money, but I figured a better example now would be The Rock because Todd, isn't he the most, isn't he the highest paid person? Right now he is, yeah. Yeah, he is. Okay. Yeah. yeah. They don't make the rock salary. And that's actually why you're not seeing people like Julia Roberts and Jennifer Lawrence out there being the face of the strike because Fran Drescher, who's the head of SAG-AFTRA, I think knows full well that's not going to look good versus <laughs> someone like Fran Drescher who had one big TV series that she still gets residuals off of. She is a much better person to make the case of residuals being important. So... As I said here, all actors are rich. Don't they have enough money? Well, SAG has 160,000 members. How many actors can you name off of the top of your head? And even the ones you can name, only 1%, if that, are true multimillionaires who never have to worry about money again. Even Julianne Moore, a very well-known actress, has won Oscar. She's in a lot of movies. She did a lot of movies in the late 90s, early aughts, in her words, a lot of crappy movies, because she said, look, I'm getting older. I don't know how many more jobs I'm going to get. I'm just going to make as much as I can so I can get residuals and save up money. And that's how it is for a lot of actors. You will have an actor who's like the it person for the moment. They'll be in a lot of things. Actually, Jennifer Lawrence is a good example. She was in a lot of movies for a while. And then she kind of disappeared for a while, for a bit, and then came back to do a few movies. Or Joseph Gordon-Levitt, who in the late aughts into the early 2010s was inescapable. When is the last time you've seen him in a movie? And residuals, do, they do allow a lot of actors to kind of take that downtime um, that they may, uh, they may not be able to get. But still, SAG has 160,000 members, only 12.7 percent of SAG members make enough to qualify for the union health insurance which is this is the minimum about twenty seven thousand dollars a year that's not a lot of money and the medium actor median actor salary is forty six six thousand dollars a year that's roughly what a librarian makes so you know actors most actors are not swimming in money the way again the rock is and again writers have enough money and yeah, writers on major TV networks used to make money. Again, if you wrote for Friends in the 90s, if you wrote for Frasier, if you wrote for Cheers in the 80s, if you wrote for The Simpsons, you made a lot of money. And that's not the case now. And streaming residuals and the lack thereof are a big reason why. Um, if anything, a lot of TV actors now, or not TV actors, TV writers now, they're living with their parents or they're living with roommates. They're not living... You know, some of the cases, they don't even own their own homes. And again, well, why should we care about writers and actors? The only thing Hollywood's making anymore are sequels and remakes, which, uh, trust me, I'm pretty sure most writers hate those sequels and remakes too, but they're not the ones who are coming up with these ideas. A lot of those ideas are studio executive mandated because these executives just said like, um, I don't know, people liked Hocus Pocus 30 years ago. Make a sequel to that. People will watch it. And <laughs> In many cases, people do, but I don't think any writer's passion project was to make Hocus Pocus 2, is my point. And again, well, if you want money, get a real job. A lot of actors do have a side job. They do, and same with writers. Some of them do gig work. Some of them do delivery. Um, I don't know if anyone remembers this actor. This came up about, Mark, you might remember this. 2018, there was an actor who was on the Cosby show, Jeffrey Owens. Someone spotted him working at Trader Joe's and there was this outcry on the internet of like, this guy was on TV. Why is he working at Trader yeah, Joe's? He was, he was uh, the husband of the main of the second oldest daughter. Yeah. Yeah. But Jeffrey Owens came out and he said like, well, I appreciate everyone's concern for me. He's like, I'm an actor. I know I've got to have a day job because th these gigs don't last forever. And Jeffrey Owens is pro his experience is probably closer to the experience of a SAG member than a Julia Roberts. Someone who, they have a good part in a television series, they're a bit actor, they make enough money to kind of 
keep getting roles or maybe be a little bit comfortable, but they also have to have a job in case they don't get a job for two years. They have to have another gig. And then again, can the studios afford this? <laughs> well, I should say David Zaslaw, but we'll get to public enemy number one later. But um, go look at the Bob Iger, the CEO of Netflix. Go look at their salaries. And, you know, they can probably afford to pay some people a little bit more. Um, although, again, the thing with streaming is we don't have the transparency that we have with film or the box office with film. And we certainly don't have the transparency that we used to have with television, with Nielsen ratings. Uh, this is another big issue. And Adam Conover's talked about this as well in terms of residuals. He's like, they keep the data to themselves. And he go, and he said, it's probably not some nefarious, it's not some nefarious reason, but these are all, these streaming pr platforms, they're not run the way, you know, they just see this as content and they're run by tech bros and they just know that data is something that's useful. So the reason they're keeping that data to themselves is they know that it could be useful to someone else and probably the people who are striking right now. So quick history of SAG. Ah, well, I just, I'm saying SAG because for a majority it has mainly been SAG, but it is still now technically SAG after in the WGA. So SAG had a number of precursors like the Actors Protective Union and the Actors Society of America. And those grew out of the stage work uh, before the Actors' Equity moved to Hollywood to try to get the actors to unionize. And there was an organizing attempt in the 20s and there was a strike in 1929 in the summer. My goodness, what did it proceed? <laughs> Oops. But that actually kind of, you know, yeah in a way helped because it did, you know, with the economic troubles of the Great Depression, that did give a little bit of a boost for actors to be like, ooh, maybe we should get some protection. And again, also in the early 20th century, labor was on the mind of a lot of Americans. Labor organizing was a big thing. Um, there was the international um, IWW. Labor activism was not just prevalent, it was radical and in some cases violent in the early, uh, especially around the uh, World War I. So it was on the minds of a lot of people. And in 2012, SAG merged with uh, the American Federation of Television Radio Actors, so now it's SAG-AFTRA. The WGA also kind of formed out of another branch of writers, which was the Authors League of America. Um, and then Screenwriters Guild was formed in 1933. Um, and the first big so first big strike was in 1952 over royalties and ownership rights. Um, actually, something go back and watch older movies. You'll notice that the credits are a lot shorter back then, and that's not because they had less writers in some cases. And that's not because they had less crew in some cases. It is because some people just did not get credited the way they should. And I mean, one of the reasons we have longer credits now is yes, there are more people working on these movies, but also because a lot of people fought to make sure that everyone who worked on a movie got credited. So it's similar where um, Mark and Todd, I'm assuming you've seen those memes of Freddie Mercury, like all of these great songs that were written by only one person, whereas, you know, a song by Beyonce or Taylor Swift or a pop singer has multiple credited writers. Have you seen those? Oh, yeah. yeah uh, the Writers Guild still even has uh, rules in its uh, in its bylaws that a, a, a original writer can choose whether someone who touches up a dialogue gets to be credited as a co-writer or not mm -hmm. so it's it's still going on even yeah. even on the union side yeah but it's it's um one of the reasons we have that now is there's a little bit more of a credit everyone lest you could potentially be sued but yeah there's a, actually you bring that up there's a great story um mark are you familiar with the television sketch show mr show yeah yeah so there was a an episode where at the end, Bob and David wanted to kind of like make joke credits. Mm. And the WGA said the one credit they could not make any jokes about were the writer's credits. And they're like, but we're writing the show. That's funny. It is. But, and again, 
you know, it's WGA is not perfect. There, uh, as you brought up, like there are still sometimes little ways people can get around crediting, but you know, the fact that people can get credited now is ultimately a good thing. But um, yeah, WJ, WJ has got some weird rules. And that's always been a, a funny one. I don't know why it didn't affect the Simpsons Halloween special. Because they always made up their own funny names for that. So, going back into history. Haven't we been here before? So when this, um, not when the writers went on strike earlier this year, but when SAG went on strike, people started talking about the 1960 strike. And that was the last time SAG and the WJ were on strike together. There have been a couple of close calls where they've nearly missed each other in terms of striking, but this was the last time they were on strike together. Although they really only overlapped by about 30 days or so because the SAG strike only went from March to April, whereas the WGA went from March some January to June, so half of the year practically. But both of them were striking over similar things, which was royalties for media sold on um, and broadcast on television. So we're starting to see people are making movies, but what happens in 19, you know, the 1950s? Television becomes a thing. And people start going, oh, we could broadcast movies on television. And people who worked on that were like, hey, wait a minute. Can we get residuals for that? And um, an interesting po uh, point. Does anyone know who the president of SAG was in 1960? Anyone in the chat? Uh, what? Was it Reagan? Yes, it was. I was about yeah. to say another fairly famous president was president of SAG, and he's widely credited with helping with the quick resolution of the SAG strike um, in terms of getting the studio heads and the actors together. Um, it was him. Also, Desi Arnaz was a big part of it. Uh, Tony Curtis was, and Janet Lee were also big forces trying to find like an amicable end to that. And that's why the SAG strike ended fairly quickly um and they got what they asked for they were able to get studio money they were able to establish the pension and health fund um the writers guild went along went around a little longer um and they usually do because i think this comes down to studios looking at it from a money issue um people although now i, I think that might be changing a bit but back in the day Stars sold movies in many cases. You wanted to go see uh, a Janet Lee, a Tony Curtis. You wanted to go see big actors. These were names that were bankable. Writers were not as bankable. So usually, and that's usually been why studios kind of uh, can draw that out a little bit more. Um, but they eventually kind of, you know, remained victorious so that's also why people were talking about the 1960 strike as well because they're like hey we all held out and we ended up getting what we wanted so i mean you know again it remains to be seen as of right now but the idea that um this was some long lasting strike between both unions not quite because sag wrapped it up fairly quickly So quick thing, these are some other strikes that happened that I we just do not have time to talk about. Um, there was a set decorator strike. There was a SAG, a SAG and after one on a commercial strike. WGA in 1981, WGA in 1985. I mean, seriously, look at this. Revenues, royalties. We're starting to see I, a I think the 1985 here. one is telling, though. That's, that's mm -hmm. connected to what's going on right now. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um... There was a commercial actor strike in 1988, the same year as a writer's strike. Uh, there was a one-day actor strike in 86. There's another one-day strike we'll get to, which is anticlimactic. Um, 1936, oh, well, this was one I couldn't find too much information on, sadly, but there was a strike over military involvement in film, which if you know how much Holly, the uh, U.S. military gets involved with Hollywood films now, you're like, oh, wow, people struck over that? Now they're like, this is a good way for us to save some money on our movie. But 
to get on to um, one of the first big strikes, um, I'm a big animation fan, so I obviously wanted to cover this one, the Disney strike of 1941. So this might be shocking to people now considering um, how prevalent Disney is in society and just how beloved the films from this era are, but by 1941, yeah, Snow White was a success. Some of the follow-ups were not. Pinocchio was considered um, underperforming, and I believe Fantasia was considered at the time to be a box office bomb. Too which, artsy. What? Too artsy for the time Too period. Artsy, which is, you know, I would consider Fantasia to be a work of art. I think it's one of the greatest <laughs> anime films ever made, at least in America. Um, but didn't do well. And if anything, the shorts that Disney was making was kind of keeping the company afloat. So there, um, there were starting to be talks of cutbacks, cuts in pay, uh, but there, uh, so there was like, how do we keep people happy in here, but also how do we save money? Like Disney was bleeding money at this one point, um, and there was a company union in Disney, but it really was not a union so to speak and there is a great book i would recommend on this called the disney revolt it's a really good and even-handed look at this strike and it doesn't point either walt disney or art babbitt as 100 percent good or 100 percent bad you learn why uh walt disney had a fairly suspicious view of unions his father was a union man but he saw how radical labor and union organizers were in the earlier part of the century. And it also gets into, was there mob activity with the unions? The answer is yes, there were. But um, Art Babbitt was the leading drive to unionize. And a lot of it was fairly, you know, reasonable stuff, which was, you know, to preserve our pay, to make sure we're credited and actually one of the things that started to happen to Art was he started to have his assignments taken away, which if you've paid attention to the um, Starbucks unionization effort, that happens to a lot of the people who try to organize at their local Starbucks. They start to lose their shifts and they're like, wait a minute, I was full time. Why am I only on six hours a week now? Um, so Art, along with 23 other animators, were fired prior to the strike and actually set off on the strike. Although not every Disney animator went on strike. There were some that did and some that continued to work. And the ones that were striking just stayed outside every day. Um, they There were a few close calls in terms of actual altercations, but um, nothing got too crazy. I have seen some images floating around that they made a guillotine in front of Disney Studios. However, I did not see that confirmed in the Disney Revolt. And so if I'm not the amount of research that that author did if he's not confirming it i'm like this could be something like a legend that became true in some people's eyes so that was one where i'm like yeah i don't think that actually happened or if i'm not seeing proof in this book i've got a question um Go ahead. this is connected to getting credit so walt disney is known as the person who has the most oscars of anyone else in history and the main reason for that is because he kept winning best animated short from the mm -hmm. 40s to the 60s. But he was the one winning it. Yep. Not the animators. Yeah. Which is interesting. <laughs> yeah. It's um, and they go into that in the book as well, where it's like, well, wait, we're doing the work on this. Why are we not being credited properly? And a lot of it was compensation as well, because they had to live in California which was an expensive place to live back then, let alone now. Um, so the strike was ultimately successful. They had a closed shop contract. Disney is to this day a union shop and they are unionized like with other animators, but on a more personal level, Art Babbitt's relationship with Disney, both the company and the man himself were severed. And Walt Disney was someone who personally saw talent in Art Babbitt and was he took this strike really personally. He didn't see this as just an employer-employee relation. He was like, how can these people whose talent I fostered and who I gave opportunity to see me like this? Um, 
it's the the final couple of chapters of that book are fairly heartbreaking to read and babbitt came back but he was never given the assignments that he had had before and he eventually just decided to leave and join the armed services i think he came back after that and then he's like nope i'm done uh but again would highly recommend reading the disney revolt if you want a very in-depth uh look at this strike uh this was one of reading and i'm like this could be a program in and of itself um I mean, there are still animators who are trying to get in with the animation union now. It's still a fairly ununionized um, area of Hollywood. So moving on to the longest strike in Hollywood history. And it has nothing to do with actors, nothing to do with directors or writers. It was musicians. So if you look to your right, James C. Petrillo, just like Sophia... <laughs> Um, was the a president of the American Federation of Musicians, and it was recording companies should pay royalties for music. So musicians could participate in radio shows and live entertainment, but no recordings. So from August 1st of 1942 through the fall of 1944, over 800 days, no new music was recorded, meaning probably for like a lot of stock footage was used for movies. And there was a lot of live radio play and a lot of live broadcast, but not a lot of stuff being recorded. And this still remains the longest strike in um, Hollywood history. Considering it lasted over two years, I think this is going to be the hard one to beat. I don't know if anyone's going to come close to that at this point. I don't think either side could last that long. I No, absolutely not. So, 1973, the writer's strike, again um they strike there was a strike in between but this was for guaranteed residuals for pay tv and video cassette sales which were new at the time um but i mean the video cassette era didn't really start until the 80s and i think that's why they went back they're like wait a minute video cassettes are a huge thing now um can we have more money please so this was one where kind of like what we're seeing with certain things happening now where work doesn't stop entirely Soap operas still had work, um, variety shows still had work, at least for the first month th um, into the strike. And so it went from March to, to June. So the demands for the residuals were met and the pay increases. And for the Writers Guild, there was an independent health fund. So um, again, ultimately a successful strike. But again, we're going to just keep seeing this pattern of, oh, there's a new form of media, a new form of revenue for the studios and the producers. Therefore, can we have some too? So 1980, actors and music, musicians strike. And I want to point out Ed Asner. Um, I think a lot of people know of Ed Asner as the actor. Ed Asner was a big union guy, um, really big in SAG, although that has kind of a heartbreaking end because near the end of his life, due to changes in SAG eligibility requirements, Ed Asner lost his health insurance and actually went to court against SAG to get his health insurance. So again... Sometimes uh, unions. Things, yeah, sometimes <laughs> these things are not perfect. Again, these are not perfect. Um, we need to be able to look at all of these things as complex. <laughs> but Ad Asner was the spokesperson for the actors, and after his um stint as a spokesperson during the 1980 strike, he was elected as the SAG president, which again makes that him losing his health insurance even more heartbreaking. It's like, come on, if you're president, you should just automatically get it. <laughs> So SAG, so SAG, AFTRA, and the AFM all went on strike. This was also stuff like HBO was starting to become a thing. So they're like, well, what are our residuals if our movies are on HBO? And uh, HBO was a place where a lot of studios would kind of, I don't want to say dump their movies that underperformed, but Todd, you might explain this a little bit better about how studios would utilize HBO if their movie didn't do that well at the box office. I'm not sure remember specifically if they did something along the lines of the of the, uh, the B block system with that or not. But but yeah, I mean, could you like basically explain like the general idea of what they would do? I mean, some of the titles that wouldn't do well, you could get them for cheap. That was a yeah. that was a plus there. And then people like they would play over um the great podcast '80s All Over went over this how they was like they would just play over oh, and yeah. over again. And like I Princess mean, Bride is a classic now. It was yeah. a huge bomb. 
I didn't see it till it was on HBO, and then I saw it every day when I was a kid. Oh yeah, and I mean, I I remember being that era. Just certain titles where if you didn't watch them, it's like you would see them in rotation, like, and it just got burned in your brain of maybe this movie was a bigger thing than it was because it was just constantly on. And this happened right. a lot with horror titles. HBO yeah. would buy, well, horror is the cheapest genre to make anyway, because you can make it for no actors and we'll all go see it and watch it anyway, because we're not here for the actors, we're here for the kills. Um, but they would get that, and that would just fill up their programming blocks. And one of the hosts of um, 80s All Over, Scott Weinberg, he's like, I think I watched Friday the 13th part two in the Boogans over and over again, specifically because it was on HBO. <laughs> Wonderful. So if you're someone who wrote Friday the 13th part two or an act or, you know, was an actor in it in this case, you might go like, hey, wait a minute. My movie didn't make a ton at the box office, but I might see a couple of cents from these repeat showings on HBO. Well, I didn't even mention that as far as that whole making a ton of money at the box office. There is one, the entire thing of like Hollywood bookkeeping has led to some infamous stories such as, I keep forgetting the actor's name, I think it's Sebastian Shaw, the guy who played Darth Vader without his helmet on, who up until like the 2000s yeah. went, I have never Wasn't seen a David cent from those. The... No, the, the one at the end of Jedi with his helmet yeah. on. Okay. This was particularly about Return of the Jedi where he's like, I have not seen a cent from that since the initial paycheck because every time I ask, they go, this movie hasn't made a profit yet. Yeah, <laughs> Beverly Hills Cop didn't make a profit. I remember that. Well, and let's, uh, I mean, more recently, I want to see, we will never see the books for The Flash. I want to see the books for The Flash. Robin Williams never got paid for Aladdin because it didn't make a profit. Eventually he sued Disney and they had to give him a Picasso as a settlement. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, the, 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 the long trend we're seeing is Hollywood accounting is weird and even well-known actors like Robin Williams sometimes just fall victim to their crazy bookkeeping. Um, so on the bright side, SAG was victorious in this strike and they got what they wanted. And this was also kind of the beginning of SAG after going, maybe we should partner up, but that didn't happen for another 30 something years. Unfortunately, uh, American Federation of Music was not so lucky. So arguably the shortest strike in Hollywood history is the director strike. The one time directors decided to go on strike. It lasted about three hours, July 13th, 1987. Um, there was a protest march that was 30 minutes. <laughs> and again, this was dispute over residuals. This was also dispute over freelance contracts, i.e. like if you've ever watched older Hollywood movies, people would be in a contract system with the studios. You know, you have to make five pictures for us. And directors were in that as well. And there was starting to be this more this idea, especially with the rise of new Hollywood cinema and kind of this, do I have to just be stuck with one studio? Can't I go do my own thing? Um, but that, again, resolved so quickly because like with Yahtzee, I think the studios kind of looked and they're like, oh, if we don't have directors, we have a problem. <laughs> because a director could still direct, you know, there could still be directors to direct a reality TV show or a soap opera or something that's not union made versus, you know, you're like, okay, we don't have actors for a while. We still have a backlog of stuff we can make. But yes, if you can't see the image, I just thought this was good. Well, that was anticlimactic. So 1988, this is currently, as of right now, um, as of September 18th, 2023, this is the longest strike in WGA history. Um, so this was over residual payments for TV shows that were broadcast in foreign countries. Uh, and this is one where I am going to say I could see both sides of the arguments here because I understand wanting to get payment and residuals for your work, but there was also this idea of well, how do we calculate um, payment in other countries? Is it just U.S. dollars? Um, what if it's sold over there? It isn't broadcast. There was a lot of talk in here about how do we calculate how to pay and residuals for this. Um, so it last, it started on March 7th and ended in August 7th, lasted 22 weeks, cost Hollywood supposedly $500 million, uh, but the contract included new formulas for calculating these residuals, including a higher minimum pay. 
and again, as uh, uh, Mark, you said earlier, like there has to be a real world way for us to solve this. Um, that's kind of what this came down to, which was like, we have to wor essentially work out new math to figure out, because again, this landscape of media and broadcast media is an ever-changing thing. So 200, this is, this is, if we're going by just any actors at all, the 2000 commercial actor strike is the longest actor strike. It lasted six months. And if you see right there, that did someone say union buster sign? That is Charlton Heston. Now, by the year 2000, Charlton Heston was known for, um, let's just say another yeah. type of activism that was <laughs> not involved with acting, but one Still of the union. <laughs> yeah i was about to say i was going through old images of strikes and i'm like man anytime the actors were on sh strike charlton heston was there on the line with a sign you gotta give like with ed asner you gotta give that man credit union man through and through and like this was not for like the sag type of actors this was for like again commercial actors which to be fair sag actors would do commercials uh, especially like foreign countries going back to that but charlton heston didn't have to be out on the front line striking with actors who you know worked in mcdonald's but he did which i'm like yeah credit to charlton heston for that um and like the, the strike was not only not only at picket lines it was also boycotting of products specifically from procter and gandall so ivory soap tied um crest it was not only a go out on the picket line and picket studios and picket these companies. It was telling other actors, don't buy from, don't buy these products. Don't cross the picket line and buy them. Um, but yeah, this is, as of right now, is six months, the longest actor strike we have ever had. And I was about to say, that's wild to me. And this was, when I said 1980 was kind of the start of the maybe SAG after should team up, the 2000 commercial actor strike was really when it became discussed. Although there was a great article in Variety um, back in 2010 about uh, like looking at the strike 10 years later and not all members of after were happy. So this is from Gordon. Um, this is from the article, quote, but SAG after doesn't use that clout, according to Gordon Duke, a strike captain and negotiating committee member. Quote, I don't recognize my union anymore, he said. The 2000 strike was successful because of the high level of member education that took place. The merger was all about suppressing the voice of the member, so union leadership never mobilizes members during negotiations. And this specifically, kind of, he was talking about, like, the commercial actors. And again, if we're going to talk about how it's not all one good and one bad, and even unions can have their faults, this is a good example of that. Commercial actors kind of feeling like they're a little left out now with the sag after merger so now we're getting to the strike that i think most people remember which is the 2007 2008 writers guild of america strike so todd when this strike happened what did you what was your understanding of why they were striking i'll admit i actually hadn't really learned much about the specifics at the time like i didn't really look into the reasons because I'll admit, proverbially younger and stupider at the time, and just hadn't really dug as deep into it. Yeah, was that a lot of how, uh, like DVDs, Blu-rays, uh, how their content was being seen after it was made and mm -hmm. out of their hands, and even preparing for the future. In a way, it's like the precursor to this. this it year. is. They didn't have yeah. streaming, but they knew something was coming. Yeah, well, like in showing show showing television on the internet was just becoming a new thing and i think that is why if we're talking about polling then versus polling now a majority of americans were not really on the side of the writers guild of america because a lot of this was over the new media not just dvd sales but like hey stuff starting to be shown on the internet like comedy central would stream certain shows and I just think a lot of the public couldn't really conceive of streaming becoming what it is now. We didn't really have the frame of reference for it. So I think we just kind of looked at it as like, why are they striking? I, for me, I'm just like, I just want 30 Rock back. Although to its credit, season two of 30 Rock, while it's shorter, is still, I would say, its best season. Just to... <laughs> Well, I think there's always uh, responses to any action. 
And it's interesting because at the time I was a fan of Lost. I was a fan of Breaking Bad. Um, a lot of the shows that season had shorter seasons and had some of their best seasons because they were shorter. Yeah. And now the idea of having a 24 episode season is kind of unheard of. That's the that's the bizarre part. You know, yeah. most shows are now eight to 12 episodes. Yeah. So this kind of ushered that in. They realized, oh, the quality is up when you write less. Yeah. We don't need to have filler episodes. If we exactly. just maybe if we um even Abbott Elementary, which is a show that I love, and I'm kind of like, oh, I'm missing the new season. It's like, well, they had I think they expanded it to 20 episodes, but even then it's like, oh, every episode is good. There's not filler right. here. Whereas, you know, I used to watch stuff like Will and Grace. You know, there were there were really good episodes, and then there were ones where it's like, okay, they clearly just had to fill a quota. Um, even Again, I'm a huge Simpsons fan. I love the golden age, but uh, if you listen to Talking Simpsons, when they talk about some of them, they're like, oh yeah, you could tell these writers were tired and we're just banging this out because they're like, we need to get to our 24 episode quota. Eric and I, I always refer to the that. second season of 24 where Jack's daughter is chased by a cougar in the woods <laughs> for an episode because they didn't know what to do with her. Yeah, they didn't know what to do. It, so yeah, it, it, there was some, I think good that came out of the strike i think you're correct and I, I would also counter that with the prestige tv of hbo so the soprano six feet under they had already shown you don't necessarily need a 24 episode series and to tell a good story so that was already like kind of in people's minds it just caught on to more mainstream shows this show is the strike is also blamed with ruining heroes, and I'm going to give a somewhat controversial opinion here. Heroes was never that great to begin with. I think the really reason I think the reason Heroes was bad when it came back in season two is because they um got all their good ideas out in season one, and it was all held together by tape anyway, and it was never going to be good, writer strike or not. One thing about the strike too, I think with the time period that it was in, the writers had the leverage and i think the studios have it now and that's over content and we could talk yeah. about that later but at the time we didn't get our shows we got crappy reality television yeah well as i put there, there's a lot of content that the yeah. studios have that they can throw out and if you look at one of the most watched streaming shows of the past five years it's er yeah because nobody watched it of this generation and now they watched it so there's yeah. what's old is new again and that wasn't happening in 2008. Yeah, we just had reruns and we had, uh, uh, you know, reality television, which I'm not going to lie. I loved some of the garbage of early reality TV. I think it was 2007 or 2008. My mom and I were really invested in Monique's Charm School Flavor of Love Girls. Oh, God. <laughs> I need to give a shout out as far as that what's old is new. Watching the internet fall in love with Columbo again has been fascinating. <laughs> Right, exact. That's what I'm talking about. I'm watching Shears back again right now. Yeah, but I, 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 I also push back on the idea that this ushered in the new era of reality TV because the new era of reality TV was already starting. The gears were yeah, 2000 turning. Survivor. Yeah. Survi yeah. yeah, Survivor. We had already had stuff like the surreal life and Flavor of Love. It was already kind of there. This just kicked it into overdrive. Uh, another interesting thing is um, there was that South Park episode where they mocked the writer's strike and they're like, this is all over internet money. Internet money isn't real, but it's worth pointing out that Matt Stone and, Tate, uh, Matt Stone and Trey Parker negotiated their own deal to get residuals for any time their show stream. So it's like, that's a little hypocritical of you. But again, it's one where I just don't think a lot of people or at least the public kind of could realize or see where streaming was going whereas i think a lot of the writers guild could i think they're like oh this is something is going to come down the pike and we need to be ready and i mean they got some of the demands achieved but i it, even with streaming now it's it's really like it's not it wasn't enough and i i think that's i don't even think that's they're saying that's why they're going back because they're like the residual system right now is not working and we need to renegotiate it which is where do we go from here 
I mean, we're seeing some good things happen in terms of labor organizing in Hollywood. Um, just earlier last week, um, the Marvel Studios VFX team voted unanimously to un unionize with Yahtzee and the Walt Disney VFX crews. They don't have a vote scheduled yet, but they're filing to unionize. Um, there is a talk, speaking of reality, of some reality stars unionizing, which I'm not big on reality TV, although, I mean, I watch RuPaul's Drag Race, I watch a lot of shows on Food Network, so maybe I am, but there's talk about them unionizing, which I don't know how that would work, but... Sounds a little silly. Sounds like that's a that's a TV show in itself. Yeah, but it's it's one like I could I, I think there could be a case made for like the real housewives who come back for season after season after season. Um, I think there's I think a case could be made for that, or maybe some of these actors just say maybe I'll join SAG and get some kind of protections. Um, I know that being a big drag race fan. A lot of drag race contestants um, have almost no financial protection when they go on the show. They're given a stipend, but in many cases, they have to leave their jobs. And some of them are working jobs where they can't just have it held for them. They end up losing their jobs, not to mention that th th there's a whole other issue about how much money it costs to go on drag race now because of how much money you have to spend on your looks. But something for another day. So I there's some arguments there that I do understand. But it's also one where I'm like, I think that that's going to be harder to work out. Um, Cartoon Network and Warner Brothers animation workers are looking to unionize with the Animators Guild. Again, not all animators are unionized still. And this was the place I had to uh, had to do a lot of uh, re-editing today. There oh. were stock shows like Drew Barrymore, Bill Maher that were going to go back and without writers. And then today, or yesterday, Drew Barrymore was like, uh, sorry, I'm not going to do that anymore. And then today, Bill Maher's just like, no. Although Drew Barrymore's reasoning was, I decided it's more important to stand in solidarity, whereas Bill Maher's reasoning was, I can't get anyone on my show, which I think, let's be real, was probably something Drew Barrymore found as well. Oh, well, wait. Drew Barrymore almost got canceled by her friends. I mean, no one's, <laughs> no one's going to come on my show. Oh, no. Well, but also... I mean, you always have to look at it from a money standpoint. I think Drew Barrymore and Bill Maher looked at it as, or I don't know about Bill Maher, but Drew Barrymore, she probably looked at it as like, I'm going to be persona non grata after this ends if I don't just decide to not do this. So I, and she, she's a producer as well. I think she's like, oh, wait a minute. If I want to make any movies with flower films again, I better uh, make sure I'm on the side of the writers and the actors because no one's going to want to make a movie for me. Or no, or again, no one's going to want to come on the show. No one's going to want to cross the picket line. So as of right now, I guess these shows aren't coming back, but um, there was someone, a variety, a piece that was published, brought up the very real point that syndicated shows talk shows work a little bit differently than other shows like again an Abbott Elementary where in some cases those contracts are like you have to have a show you have to make content strike be damned so I don't know if that was the case here but it's one worth considering and I did want to note again there's a new Gallup poll that was taken um early in September about who support um the strike support so 72 percent of americans that were surveyed support the wga strike and 67 support the sag after strike and i think a lot of that has to do with i think number one there is i think a lot more just conscientious um or a consciousness around labor right now in america but i think it's also because of who the voice people uh the voices are for the wga again Adam Conover, he's someone people recognize, but he doesn't look like someone who's rolling in dough. Um, and Fran Drescher is, again, an actor who, she's had bit parts in movies, she's been in some very famous films, she had one big TV series, but she probably makes a good amount of money off of those residuals. She's not Julia Roberts big, and I think that's easier for a lot of Americans to relate to, and they're like, oh, I understand that. She was on a TV show 30 years ago. She's not getting a ton of work now. Yeah, she's probably not getting a lot of money from streaming. Um, also, just I think a lot of the streamers have built up a lot of bad blood with viewers. Um, 
the way Netflix cancels its shows after two seasons because they're they're like, we don't care about maintaining a base of viewers. We just need new viewers all the time, which I'm sorry, that's just not how things work. <laughs> You're not always going to find new viewers. It's good to just foster um, a loyal fan base in some cases. And uh, I mean, again, David Zaslav just torching his reputation, canceling stuff. And also the fact that people, um, a lot of producers are in uh, heads of streaming companies are taking stuff off and there's no physical release. A lot of regular viewers are seeing like, wait a minute, I liked something. It's not here now. We're going Why back to I lost content that we haven't yeah. had to deal with since the twenties. It's ridiculous. Yeah. I think there's a lot of people who are, I think the, the luster, the shine is coming off of the streaming or the streaming companies for a lot of viewers. And I think there's also some content fatigue because people are, I mean, uh, Scorsese was talking about this in a recent interview in Time Magazine where he's like, there's a difference between art and content. And these streaming companies, they just want content. They don't care if it's good. They don't care if someone put their heart into it. They just need something to crank out to be the next big thing people talk about for a weekend. And I think even viewers might be getting tired of that. I mean, I don't know. I know I am personally, but. So something you had said before, we don't know because we don't have the data. Mm -hmm. I mean, the, they could want Stranger Things to be a success and convince us all that it is. And it mm -hmm. may not be as popular as some other shows on the sh We don't have any clue. Yeah. Because they create the narrative. Yeah, um, I, what was I, my biggest, one of the biggest issues with, with the strike? It's like I agree with them getting residuals, but in order for it to work, they have to create a third party like the Nielsen system, like the box right. office receipts that get sent by the theaters to this company that has nothing to do with the studios. There needs to be a data miner mm -hmm. that tells you what's being watched, but then if we do that. Then we get into privacy issues. And then that's a that's whole another ball of wax. So I don't know. I honestly don't know where this strike ends and that they're happy with the way the new technology mm -hmm. is. Yeah, it is. Well, and that's where I do agree with you a little bit that some of these streaming companies have the leverage because at the end of the day, they have the data. And I think they're holding on to it with an iron grip. Um, well, like you, you talk about like uh, writing a narrative and Netflix, I think more than any other streaming company does that narrative writing. What was that really bad movie with like Gal Gadot? It was a spy movie, but they said it's the number one movie in oh, the yeah. world. Well, they always have their top 10, their top 10 of what's being watched, but it's always the 10 things they're pushing. Exactly. You know, there's never so like a surprise hey people are watching this right now <laughs> and it's like a lot of them just kind of fall off the map like I remember back when it was that, that when bird box came out they're making it seem like it was going to be this big hit and then most people just didn't really talk about it it disappeared in two weeks and you that mean, happens in a quiet not a quiet place yes that's the one <laughs> yeah um <laughs> this this is one where to give uh jeff bezos a little bit of credit amazon prime had the right idea with the boys where Number one, they're like, we'll release the first few episodes for you to watch. And then we're doing week by week. So it stays in the conversation longer. It stays in the public consciousness longer, but they're releasing it on physical media. So at least they're going back to some of these, um, you know, quote unquote, old school style of getting residuals. And I think that's also one of the reasons they're doing it is because they're like, well, we can make more money this way too. Well, um, Disney's that's, that's also. Exactly. That's what I meant by having the content. You know, Disney's now releasing four of their big first shows that they had on 4K, yeah. which they said they'd never do. Yeah. <laughs> well, and I mean, it, it's also, we don't know the finances of the, I mean, I mean, to be fair, again, stu old school studio math is also funny, but we don't know the finances of these. Like, supposedly Netflix has been running in the red for years, but they're producing shows at a crazy rate. So you do wonder, like, how is this all working? It's it's funny, man. <laughs> I mean, to be fair, that's also, per one of your earlier points, that's how the tech industry works is you don't it's less about making a profit more about making sure you're the biggest name on the table that was that was paypal for the better part of a decade 
Yeah, I mean, I've I, you and I have Todd and I have talked about this. We don't have Netflix anymore. We're like, why does anyone still have Netflix? Do they even have shows that people are big anymore besides Stranger Things? And it's and you said, I think half the reason people still have Netflix is because that was the big, that was the only streaming name in the game for a long time. I, mean, I have three shows I watch. <laughs> I mean, I, hey, I've never forgiven them for what they did to Glow. So first season I've, was good. I will go to my grave. It'll say on my headstone, uh, screw Netflix for what you did to Glow. <laughs> Such a good show. Can we talk about the AI uh, aspect? Yeah, of course. Second? We can do that. Um, so this is the one area that I kind of think is absolutely ridiculous with the strike. Mm -hmm. uh, just because it's now called artificial intelligence, how different is it than everyone standing on the Titanic during the day scenes in Titanic that were CGI mm -hmm. characters that were all based on real people? I mean, are we not going to do that now? Yeah. One thing that the actors have to make sure they don't do is make sure projects don't get made that they could have had jobs in. No one's making Lawrence of Arabia again, where you're going to have thousands of troops mm. far away being filmed, all fighting each other. You can't afford that anymore. You're going to yeah. use CGI, and you're not going to use a plain face with no features. You're going to use somebody's face. So... Uh -huh. I think part of that Rubicon got crossed actually with some of the later Star Wars stuff where it was they were basically like licensing out full versions of like Peter Cushing or Mark Hamill and people were looking now, going, this, is this is a okay? Good point. And that's been that's been controversial since that vacuum commercial with Fred Astaire that was in the nineties. But at the same time, you also have James Earl Jones, who when he filmed Obi Wan Kenobi, reportedly read a lot of words from the dictionary and had it recorded. So that Disney can use his voice as Darth Vader after he's passed away. Well, that was the thing. He knew what he was doing. He consented to that. Right. A lot of what these extras are talking about is they were just told, we just want to scan you. They weren't being told what they were being scanned for. And again, I think the other big issue is the, the lack of payment. So it's like it's a one-time payment versus... I think there's a lot of extras who would probably be a little bit okay if they're like, oh, good, I don't have to go to work Every time they need a crowd scene, as long as I get a paycheck, that's fine. It's the, we don't get a paycheck every time. I don't know when I'm used and I don't get paid for it. That's where I think a lot of the controversy is coming from. I mean, and I'd be okay with, you know, the family signing off. Like if the family of Peter Cushing felt he would have no problem with it and, you know, then that'd be okay. Yeah. But. And uh, yeah, but I, I think like with the extras also in terms of, um, going back to making the minimum payment for health insurance, um, a lot of actors doing crowd work and doing extra work and getting that like thousand dollar, a couple hundred dollars is how they can meet that minimum annual requirement to get that health insurance. So if they're doing that, we're just going to scan you one time and then never pay you again. That's taking away a lot of actors ability to maybe get that threshold to get the health insurance so that's so i wonder reason. again there's always a reaction to something i know that in the 90s there are a lot of movies that have visual effects that you don't know are actual visual effects uh for instance in the line of fire with clint eastwood whenever there's a big scene with the president most of the people in the audience are not actually there their visual effects mm -hmm. uh, i think the fugitive had some too and i wonder did they do that because they didn't have to pay extras <laughs> you know because the prices are going up yeah but it is like it, it is it's something where it's like i think the one-time use is that's one where i'm like oh it's not fair you should at least give them something if you use them again <laughs> but it's uh it's it, it i mean this artificial intelligence visual effects it can be good as well like it can help people like if someone is sick it can help them look better on screen like there's a lot of good uses for it but it's basically a how are they used responsible uh, responsibly i'm I mean, I'm not as concerned about the AI scripts because I have read some of those AI scripts and they're bad yeah. after the first few lines. I read the AI 30 Rock script. Oh, I felt my soul leave my body. <laughs> it's spooky. I, I, I don't think real writers have much to worry about in terms yeah. of can an AI script compete with the writer? But I think, I think studios don't care. They're just like, whatever, we'll get a real person to punch it up. But it's never, it's not going to be the same as like the golden age of a writer's room. And again, if you love stuff like The Simpsons from the 90s, the reason that was so good was the writer's room. You had like people like Conan O'Brien bouncing off of other people and creating these great ideas. 
but again, I'm with you. I'm with you. I don't know quite how they're going to solve this in a way that everyone's happy. It's probably going to end with at least one one party not being entirely happy. <laughs> like I would but give it if I was a studio, I'd give in with the residuals, but I don't know how you can convince anyone that what you're doing is honest and accurate. I know, and I wonder without giving up a lot. I wonder if this is going to lead to certain directors and um, actors or writers just saying, we're not working with, I'm just going to throw this out, Netflix anymore. I know Scorsese was very burned by Netflix for how they handled the Irishman. So he's like not working with them. On and the I flip wonder... side, are you going to get people doing what George Lucas did, which is, I don't need to be a part of the Directors Guild. I'm big yeah. enough. I can make my own things. Yeah. You don't have to be in my movie, but a my movie is more... going to be there forever. A bit more fragmentation is what yeah. likely might happen. But I, I could see a couple of, um, although, you know, I don't think it's going to stop studios from selling the rights of uh, something to Netflix or so. Because I heard Todd Haynes was not happy about May, December being sold to Netflix. He was like, I wanted this to get a proper theatrical release. Now it won't. <laughs> Which I'm with him. I want that movie to get a pro uh, proper theatrical release, not just be hyped up for one weekend and then disappear forever. But that's, that's just because what... I love Todd Haynes. <laughs> but at the same time, that's almost, I mean, the very fact that we can already watch just about every summer movie but Oppenheimer on TV right now, I mean, it's a very mm -hmm. different world. You it know? is. 10 years ago, you still wouldn't have seen Barbie until Christmas time and it'd been a good Christmas release. Mm -hmm. You know, 10 years before that, it would have been a year before you could see it. I remember, now waiting, it's three to I four remember months. waiting six months to get a VHS tape. So I'm, I'm, it is, it's uncharted territory. And ultimately, we, I can look at this from a historical perspective, but at the end of the day, it's like, well, I don't have all the answers to this. Everything's become the horror model. Make your money in the first three days because that's yep. all you've got. <laughs> That's kind of been it. Although there have been a couple of success stories um, just as we're wrapping up. The big um, talk to me, I mean, although that's a horror movie and horror movie, horror movies have legs like other genres do, like other genres do not. But um, Pixar's Elemental, a film that was dismissed as a bomb when it came out, but it hung in there. And to Disney's credit, they let it stay in the theaters and it ended up making a profit. Yeah. Or um another uh, like Spider-Man Across the Spider-Verse, uh I would say the best animated film of 2023 although Hayao Miyazaki has a movie coming out so it's probably going to take that title. But that stayed in theaters for a long time and even became number 1 again in its fourth week. Yeah. So I think studios are starting to kind of see like okay, maybe we don't need to just rip this stuff out of theaters right away. Maybe we can let it stick around in see how it works but again none of the three of us work for studio sadly <laughs> all right um oh i was about to say are there any uh questions but autumn yeah automation versus labor has been a conflict since the luddites yes it has um do ordinary journalist news own their output um um any amount of the value um that was a question I think it depends on the journalist in terms of do they own their work. Um, well, I'm I'm sure some you know highly ranked or well known big name like a journal. Ronan Farrow owns their work, I believe. But uh, but the person who's working for uh, you know Boston Globe and you know writing stories about you know what happened in um, whatever town and traffic accidents and this and that uh, and then I've seen. AP stories showing up, for example, on WMUR. So mm -hmm. they get, they they have um, more than one life, so to speak. Uh, and that so is one that I do not know. I think they might be part of a different guild. Um, so yeah, that is one where I would say, I don't know. I think the big name journalists have ownership. Smaller ones, likely not. But that is a very good question. And I'm sorry, I cannot answer it. And I can tell you from experience, uh, my background is a lot in manufacturing. Mm -hmm. And people who make the documents to create new products, they don't own any of that IP. Yeah. Yeah, that's a, uh, yep, that's that's something I do know about. I actually used to work in corporate. So before I- Same thing with computer library. software. If you make computer <laughs> software for a company, the company owns it. Right. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. Are there any other questions uh, or comments? Uh, does anyone, I know the Writers Guild is going back. Do we, uh, does anyone think that they're going to reach an agreement? I personally am not too optimistic. They need to get something to make them save face. You, as, as you soon say, as they get something positive. Um, then. Mm -hmm. Oh, Kevin, you had a question? You think it's going to be over in a couple of weeks? Uh, I yeah, you think it's, the strike's going to be over in a couple of weeks? I mean, the I way have you no, told... I, I have no idea. I as I said at the top, I'm actually very surprised the actors have held out this long. They usually don't. Although we're getting, in terms of SAG, the 1980 strike is the longest one, and we're coming up on that. In 30 days, we're going to pass the 1980s um, actor strike length. And we're two weeks away from passing the 1988 Writers Guild stripe length. Um, from what I have seen, both of the both of the guilds are very like let's hold out and hold the line because I think they see if we don't, then it's not going to get any better for us. And I think especially the Writers Guild, they looked at the losses they took from the 2007 2008, and they're really like, let's not have that happen again. Um. I remember all the late night, the talk show guys at night made fun of the Writers Guild that week when they gave in. Like yeah. they, they looked at that as a loss that mm -hmm. week. So that was interesting. Which really, when you look at the development, it's like, yes, there were losses, but they got two thirds of what they asked for. It's just, right. it was not calculated for what streaming would become now. And I think that's, again, why they're going back. Um, I'm just, uh, I know Todd is heartbroken over Dune Part 2 being pushed back. I know he's... I, I've got enough other stuff I'm looking forward to at least, but I'm also, and also I'm looking at it this way. Right about now, I think this is a good time for the picketers because like, we're coming to a season where the producers could actually hurt for some of the stuff getting held up. Yeah. Well, I mean, I also think the other reason Zaslav decided to push Dune Part 2 back is he knew with Oppenheimer... They didn't have a prayer for any visual effects Oscars. <laughs> Which, oh, sure. yeah. again, considering no. that was a win for Universal because Warner Brothers burned their bridge with Nolan, that's gonna be spit in the eye. Yeah, there's, and I, I mean, I, I think between like production design, I think Barbie is probably gonna take it, like that movie or not. That is production design out the wazoo, uh, costuming as well, and I think any visual effects. I don't know how you don't give it to Nolan at this point. The man. No, the only competition it had was Dune. Now it's pushed. Yeah, on. and I I think that's why Zaz maybe Zaslov made a good idea going. We're gonna push that back to 2024 and win those awards. I don't know because he also pushed it to March, which isn't what exactly. Are you? This man's not good at his job. He should be kissing Greta Gerwig's feet for yeah, saving. I'm just Warner saying Potter. I don't know how much I want to think this is smart strategy at this point. As much as it was a. This was a hostage gambit that failed for him. No, I think I think it was. I think I think Todd, you're right. He probably pushed that back to see if there would be backlash towards the writers and actors of it being pushed back. And no, all the backlash came to Zaslav, and he's like, "Oh, I'm gonna go cry into my money again." I I'm still I'm mad. I'm I think that's also why we didn't hear much from Martin Scorsese regarding the strike was he was probably like, look, I do not want to get Killers of the Flower Moon he, pushed back he's anymore. Thrilled right now, he's one of the possible spoilers for Oppenheimer. Absolutely. Eh, I I think Nolan's the the. I mean, we'll have an Oscar program later. I think I, I think Nolan's the man to beat this year for director. Oh, I I hope you're right, but I, the story behind Killers is very interesting. I mean, I love my man Marty, so if he wins, I'll be happy. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I I um I I think the re the main reason that that Warner Brothers kept color purple on the schedule is they're like, oh, this is our big dramatic contender for the Oscars this year. Uh, don't you know what? Have we seen the trailer yet? Oh, I have. It's good. They have a trailer for Color Purple. Yeah, it came out like a month months ago. Really? Okay, yes. I have to check that out. I yeah. wasn't convinced it was coming out. I haven't seen anything yet. Look, I'm gonna go watch it and cry sometime around Christmas. I gotta go check that out. All right. Yeah. All right. Uh, any other questions before we go? Well, um, you know, so just one thing to clear up. Uh, no, um, there there was at the start of the strike some question of, oh, can we not go to the movies anymore? Can we not stream anything? Is that crossing the picket line? Both the Writers Guild and the Screen Actor Stag After have said, go to these movies. 
go watch these shows because that is going to show these studios that people like this stuff this is what people want we don't just want reality tv over and over again so uh it is okay to go see a movie in theaters essentially and um quick programming note so next month is the um we're going to be doing italian horror but it is going to be the first monday of the month um so that is going to be october 2nd um for italian horror um there's going to be a schedule change for november we're doing it on the same night it is not going to be an introduction to japanese cinema todd is in the sound of music up in concord so he is getting um ellie is gonna tag in for something i'm not sure what it will be it might be a deep dive on the room um but i'll talk to her and we'll see what we're gonna do well hi mock yeah well hey liz you... one more thing oh. it... Oh, go ahead. One more thing. Did you see John Waters got a star on a of course I Hollywood did. Walk of Fame? Of course I did. It was a great day for campers. We were like, finally, <laughs> getting the respect he deserves. And I love how he talked about, since he was on the Walk of Fame, he goes, I've uh... never been closer to the gutter. <laughs> I, I love that, man. National treasure. Protect yeah, but you have to pay to, You have to actually pay for that yourself, you know. Yeah, but still. I'm you happy. actually pay for that yourself, you know. Oh yeah, no, it's fine. I'm just yeah, I'm glad he's got I it. I guess, yeah. And he's got an academy, <laughs> a big exhibit at the Academy Museum right now, which is one of the few times I wish I could go to California. I did see that. Yeah. You can see that online. It's good. Yeah, it's great. Um, but yeah, no, Mark, if we do end up doing the room program, I'll have to let you know so you could come in and we can say the uh, I'll be the generic Mark. The quintessential <laughs> oh hi Mark line. Oh hi, but, uh, oh, hi Mark. But yeah, I Ellie is visiting this weekend and she and I are gonna try to figure out what we're gonna do in November. So um, thank you all for coming and have a wonderful night. Bye. Thanks, Liz. Bye, oh, thank everybody. You.